going to ask you one of those deep Bible questions. How to be the greatest? Jesus was in Jerusalem the final time, just a short while before his great sacrifice. What do you think the 12 apostles and disciples were arguing about? And that would include Judas. He was among them at this point. <clears throat> what were they discussing? What were they arguing about? You're going to say, they were arguing about things like love and how to be concerned for each other, how to bond, a deeper understanding of the Bible. No! They're arguing about who was going to be the greatest among the 12. Me, and by the, it wasn't the only time this argument had come up, but it, you know what a time to do it. And it showed that without the Spirit, and they all, I'm sure they be, became very great men. I'm not taking anything away from them. Without God's Spirit, they were as carnal as a jaybird. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to go to Luke 22, 24. But this is what they were discussing. Who is the greatest? And we're going to look at um, Jesus Christ's answer to that question. And I think it will be helpful to all of us. We're going to look at the answer to that question, who is the greatest? Luke 22, um, verse 24. Now there was also a dispute among them. We assume it was just a mild discussion. It might not have been all that mild. As to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings and the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. And, of course, the Roman Empire was... Let me get my dates careful, say this carefully, had transitioned from a republic into more of a military dictatorship. So they, I mean, they still had some elections. I'm not saying they didn't have any aspects of the republic, but they understood from the world they lived in about authority. And this guy has this office, and Herod has that office, and you know, all the. Um, so they understood about exercising what I call. <laughs> under the thumb kind of authority or more autocratic forms of government. And notice verse 26, but not so among you. Not so among you, meaning the 12. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. Now when you say that, it just sounds like words, but I think Christ really meant it. We want to this morning take a look at what it means to govern as he who serves and even um, and even when you're not leading to still serve they call it um, it's actually called servant leadership and uh, we're going to look at that a little more and Christ goes on to say, For whoever is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves, is not he who sits at the table. Yet I, meaning Jesus Christ, am among you as one who serves. In other words, Jesus set an example of serving and not being served. But serving, not being served. And I think <clears throat> it's such... Um, an obvious point, but I think understanding it is harder than it sounds. It's so easy to say, oh, you just serve other people and be a humble servant. You hear those words all the time. And, and I'm sure a lot of uh, people say, especially when they're trying to prove how good they are, I'm just a humble servant of the people. You never know. A lot of politicians say that, too. It turns out they're corrupt. They go in the office as a regular guy. They come out a multimillionaire. Yeah, you see who they serve, don't you? I could give you some examples, but I won't distract by mentioning it. <clears throat> Philippians 2.5. Philippians 2.5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. By the whole chapter is worth reading, but we're just going to emphasize certain things here, but... Verse 6, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. you got to think about that. There's God, 
the Father and God the Son, or if you like the term God the Father and God the Spokesman, or God the Father and God the Executive Assistant, whatever title you like to look at it. And he's up there with God. It's hard for us to imagine what it's like being God. Because we're in a circular world where, you know, you're born, you hit your peak at, I guess, age 40, you get old and you die, and then your kids, same cycle, everything, you know, living, dying, living, dying. But God never had a beginning. And I know we can't really understand that, and we'll never have an end. We'll always be at his peak. And he has, we were just discussing this about evolution. I just mentioned this real briefly. Um, they, um, they now know something they didn't know years ago. For life to exist, you have to have information. And it's like a binary computer code, DNA and RNA. RNA kinds of transmission from DNA to molecular machines that do all the stuff that make your cell do what it does. And, and every single cell, it's kind of hard to believe that. But, they, but the scientists studied it, and they discovered, I don't know, something like 15 or so percent of the um, DNA directs molecules that they know of. So they said the rest of it is junk, left over from evolution. But as they did more study, guess what they discovered? All that genetic information is useful. It tells the molecules in which order to be made, how to fold, the speed in which they put together a bunch of related things that are vital to making the cell live. And then they discover some recently, those DNA things that tell you know, the cell which kind of molecules to make, they do more than one thing. They make more than one molecule, which complicates impossibly the world of evolution. My only point is, Every cell and every animal and every plant is unbelievably complex. You realize God did that? And, and, and they only, and the lady said, we're just beginning to look at what they thought was the, the leftover DNA. We're finding out it does stuff. They got years more to look it up. In other words, with all they've learned, they just started. God is more of a genius and a power than we can imagine. You look at the sun, and you know, it's like all those fusion nuclear explosions, and, and it's just one of, it's only an average star and a whole galaxy full of stars, and then there's more galaxies than they can imagine. God has made all that, controls it. Now, you're going to go from that glory to being a worm. I mean, it's in a respectful sense. A human being is like a worm compared to God. Think about giving that up for 33 and a half years to live a perfect life to serve mankind. That is real service. That's what Jesus Christ did. You're going about giving up power. Wow, that's giving up power. And it wasn't robbery to be equal with God. Verse 7, made himself of no reputation. And taking on what? Taking on what? Taking on what? The form of a bond servant. And coming in likeness of men. In other words, he really was a man. He could feel pain and fear and, you know, he stick his finger and he bleed. You know, that's, from being God to that, that's quite a jump. And being found in the appearance as a man, Christ humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to death on the stake or cross. That's real servant leadership. That's real servant leadership. And, and I want to try to define Servant leadership, we're going to talk about a little bit this afternoon. Servant leadership, it puts serving other people a higher priority than serving yourself. I know that's almost the opposite of human nature. It's me. That's all what I care about is how does it affect me? You know, and promoters and advertisers will tell you, when you talk to people about things, tell them how it's going to affect them. Because they don't really care about well, maybe some do, but to some extent, they don't care about the country, the group, a lot of times even the team, you know, we're, it's me. How does it help me? And uh, so, at any rate, keep all that in mind, um, but it's serving other people 
above all priorities, rather than managing, you know, for stuff that will make you look good, you focus on creating an environment that your whole team or your neighbors or your family or your church can thrive in. You're trying to help everybody thrive. In other words, you want to be a good servant for your church, your neighbors, your family, for everybody. Taking care of your people, and which may mean sacrificing your time and effort for the group, not for self. Selfless type of leadership. Actually, if you think about it, it does make you the leader. If you're in an organization and you're the one who's really out there seeing to it everything works and you're taking care of your people and you're working hard, one day they're going to realize, hey, we can't do without him. Then you're really a leader. Think about it. He really is out there helping other people, serving other people, encouraging other people, seeing to it that the group works. Then they're going to realize how much they need. I think that's part of it as well. Um, your input's necessary. Mark 10.37. Mark 10.37. They said to him, grant us that we may sit. Now, the, this is another discussion, but it's the same pattern, uh, separate incident. Grant us that we may sit on your right hand and on your left. You know, these two guys known as the Sons of Thunder. Um, now, by the way, when they say sit on his right hand and left hand, you know, right and left, they mean be the top two men in God's kingdom, because that's what it means. You're the right-hand man of the big cheese or the left-hand man. Usually in any government, there's they call it the inner circle, the inner cabinet. There are two or three or four people that, that the leader consults the most and they have the most power and influence. That's who they wanted to be. You know, uh, these two, uh, anyway, two apostles, the sons of thunder. And here's what Christ said, verse 40. But to sit on my right hand or on my left is not mine to give. It was, it's up to God the Father, I presume. But here, but he added to it. But it's for those for whom it is prepared. In other words, don't struggle and scheme and fight for the top spot or the top spots, plural. God's already made those decisions, and I just don't worry about it. God's made those decisions. You're not going to, you know, in other words, you should be thinking about how you can serve Others, instead of getting to be, you know, on top or whatever you think. So I'm going to talk five helpful tips on how to be a humbling servant. Five helpful tips. Um, at least some of these we haven't said in the past, so some of this is kind of new. Um, we want to serve the church, our neighbors, and our family. You know, be a good citizen, a good person, a good team member. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to read off the five tips, and then we'll talk about them a little bit uh, for a few minutes. Tip number one, serve where needed. Kind of look for needs. Do they need any help? I mean, if they don't, they don't, but serve where needed. It's nice to have, if you're running some kind of company, you've got employees looking around and saying, well, is there something that's not being done here, not being done right, or you can use some extra help on it? And that'd be a great employee to have. The guy that's looking to see if something needs to be done that's not being taken care of. You're out there looking for needs. It uh, could be human needs, you know. But um, two, brighten someone's day. Be a positive uplift to the team. Because... Um, you probably have heard them say this. I'll just say what I read in the sports pages. Some coaches will actually keep some players on the team and take some players off the team, not based on ability, but based on what they call the locker room effect. And you're going to say, what's the locker room effect? As best I understand it, some people, you know, the teams try to have their team unity and high spirit, especially in and games which are more like war, like football, but it applies to other sports too. You want somebody who creates a positive locker room or adds to the positive feeling, helps encourage other players to do their best, keeps a positive spirit in the locker room. And some that are, uh, I think Stan mentioned one of his 
sermons that we heard recently uh, about a guy that Tom Landry was a great player, but he was such a, I'm not playing by the rules, I'm doing my own thing. He was such a negative influence in the locker room, he cut him from the team. I don't know if anybody else ever picked him up because they probably heard what the problem was. You want somebody in your group, team, church, that's a positive force, not one that drags everybody down. It's, I want to see you and him fight and quarrel. You, you, I've seen that in playgrounds and even inside of companies, even inside, would you believe, academia. I tell you what he said about you and, you know, get you at each it's like it's almost a game that people get each other at each other, and even in families. I guess I better not say that about my own. But there are people in families who add to problems. They make it worse. <clears throat> um, so brighten someone's day. Number three, pray with someone. It's, and I, I think one man said, it's easy, almost like a off-the-cuff remark to say, I'll pray for you. And that's fine, too. But he says, pray with someone, too. And maybe you all can pray for each other. And I never thought of that. Pray with someone. Um, that's having a crisis or whatever, you know, they'll tell you what it is. Um, number four, talk to people live, maybe on the phone or in person. Um, now there's a lot of communication is done through big tech. But I'm not an expert on social media, so I can't say. But I'm reading people saying that having all these friends in the, I guess, the TikTok sphere or the whatever it is, all these big tech spheres, is not the same thing as real friends. Real, and, and that's the problem with a lot of young people. Uh, they're on their devices all the time. They got a lot of people giving them thumbs up and likes and dislikes, depending on what's in and what's not in. But real people that they know and talk to, it's limited. And I've even found a lot of young people, I'm, I don't like it, but, oh, I want you to text me or get on Facebook. They don't want to talk in person. I don't like that. I mean, personally. I think it's better to deal with real people on the phone or face to face. Um, well, I guess you can have that phone call where you can see them. Uh, I don't think I look good on television phone. But anyway, that's regardless. <laughs> People say you can make up your own decision there. Um, and number five, be a cheerleader for someone. There's one particular person who may need encouragement. Be a cheerleader for that person. So let's look at number one first. Serve where needed. Um, Paul says in Philippians 2, 3 through 4, Paul says, look out for the other person's interests more than your own. Now, I know that is totally unnatural. And he goes on and say Christ did it. And, but Philippians 2, 3 through 4, he says, look at somebody else's interests first. We're not saying let people take advantage of you or don't take care of yourself. And you got to watch out for con men and people that are always asking you for money. So I, I'm aware because I've been con more than once before, too. And I wish I could say everybody is honest and won't take advantage of you, but no, we can't say that. Although, if I had to make a choice between my taking advantage of somebody else or them taking advantage of me, I'd rather have them take advantage of me. I'd rather have them be the villain than me be the villain. Um, but look at other people's interests. And maybe it's, you can volunteer to help them with something. You can benefit them in some kind of way. Um, but just kind of serve where needed in a humble way, and I think that's a good thing. Number two, brighten someone's day. In Matthew 5, 16, Christ said, be a light to the world. You know, be up there high where they can see you, a bright light. Like I think uh, Jerusalem was supposed to be the, the shining city on a hill. I believe Ronald Reagan took that quote about America to the world should be a shining city on a hill. He said, if America goes, the world goes dark. 
And that may still be true. We go, anyway, we shall see. I have this fear. If American leadership drops away uh, and certain countries like China and some others take, and Germany take leadership of the world, it will be a darker, more dangerous place. And I'm not against any of those people. I'm just talking about general statement here, general statement. Um, but brighten someone's day. Um, so try to find ways to be a positive force. And maybe, and they say a lot of times you can't do anything big and huge to brighten someone's day, but maybe little things. You have a neighbor that's elderly, although I'm getting elderly, so it's hard to say that help the elderly. I'm getting there myself. But, but one thing happened to me about three years ago, I thought it was nice. We have a big side yard, a lot of leaves, because we got trees and and what that. And, uh, and they have this thing in Cape where you got to get your leaves on a curve in a big pile for this snake-like, caterpillar-like machine to come out and scoop them up. You got to get them out there at a certain point to get the leaves out of the way. So Natalie and I were out raking leaves <laughs> Matthew and his son, Mr. Shorty's grandson, I used to be his friend, he's passed away now, they came over and helped us rake the leaves. And they're a lot more young and vigorous than we were. They actually did more of it than we did. And we went over to the smaller side and they did the bigger side. I, I, they volunteered. So I, and then the next year, Sam and Matthew both are about 35 to 40. They're younger than I am and very fit. We were out getting groceries or something. We came back, they pretty much had our yard raked up for us. I'm not making this up. They, and uh, I told uh, Matthew, I said, well, your grandfather would be proud of you <laughs> if he were still alive. Now, we're elderly, at least compared to them. Um, now, since then, we're paying somebody to do it, so in case you think I'm trying to take advantage of them. But I thought that was nice of them. You know, they're young and they got young families. It's nice, it's nice having people with babies and little kids across the street from us. Uh, when we drive home, I tell Carl, watch out for these little kids and their bikes, they're riding around my, anyway, it, it, it's not bad, but it's, it's nice. And if you can help some of your neighbors, I'm not saying rake leaves, because maybe we're getting old for that, but in other ways that maybe you can help them, pick up groceries for them, um, little things to brighten up the lives of friends, family, neighbors, and church people would not be a bad thing. Now, I'm going to tell you this stupid joke. It's called A Parrot Learns a Lesson, but I like it. Um, it's not original, but eh, it doesn't matter. God buys a parrot, and it's going to be an expensive talking parrot. He brings it home. The parrot can talk all right, and it must have had a sailor to train it. It's its vocabulary is in the bottom of the gutter. Worse, even this guy hadn't heard of. And he, and he insults his wife. He insults the kids. He even insults the dog, who he's up on the perch. The dog can't get him. He said horrible things. The guy gets mad. The parrot, he grabs him, opens the freezer, and throws him in the freezer, slams the door. I'll teach you a lesson. Fifteen minutes later, he opens the freezer. The parrot comes out all frozen. <laughs> I'm sorry for what I said. The guy says, you're forgiven. But I want to ask one question, says the parrot. I know what I did, but what did that chicken do? <laughs> yeah, what did the chicken do? Um, so he learned a bird lesson. Um, and I, th I think if there's any lesson <laughs> for that stupid story, it'd be um, we want to do the reverse. Instead of being a person that's causing trouble like the bird was, we want to be someone that brightens people's lives by what we say. And uh, anyway, try to be more tactful. And we all need to learn that. So I'm, we all need to learn how to be more tactful. Number three, intentionally pray with someone. Now in Ephesians 6.18, it talks about uh, praying always, uh, and praying for others. And I think, I think Paul is saying, you know, pray for each other, and of course pray for yourself. And I think we want to add to it, not just praying for people, but praying with them. 
I, and I thought of a situation. Let's say you know they've got a big crisis coming up in a few weeks, and you can either pray for them here at church, or let's say you call them on the phone, and you say, I'm going to pray for you on the phone. Just pray, you know, and you all have a nice little... Or well, I guess if you want to do it by Skype, if you like that kind of thing, or, or the TV phone, if you like that, that's fine. We see each other if you like it. But whatever, um, just pray for them and with them. Or maybe if you're here, you can hold hands and pray for them. Um, and maybe the two of you want to pray for each other and with each other. You know, they say, well, I have this problem. You say, well, I may have that problem coming up in two weeks. And both of you pray for each other. That somehow you're praying for them is a form of encouragement. But also, of course, you know God's going to hear a prayer like that. God's going to hear a prayer where you're trying to help somebody else. Pray for the other guy, not just for yourself. Um, it's like you're spiritually coming alongside him with prayer power to help lift him up. You know, it's like I'm coming alongside you and I'm going to help lift you up. Um, uh, and I think praying for each other is not a bad thing. Now I want to get back to something I said and Christ told the disciples about the two top spots. He, he said it's already been prepared for somebody. I don't think the 12 disciples would get it. If I were to guess. By the way, do you know that David's name is in the Bible more often than anybody else? I think it's like a thousand times. And there's nobody else in the Bible named David. Most of the names like Zedekiah, Zechariah, a whole bunch of, I repeat it, there are more than one, more than one, more than one. I, I, I'm saying this and I could be wrong, but I heard a scholar say, uh, after David, the word David is not used in the Bible for anybody else. And I believe that's true of Moses as well. And most Jewish people will not name their kids David. They think it's, I can't explain it, but I'm just saying what they say. My only point is, David is special in the Bible. Even well into the New Testament, when people are addressing Christ, they say, son of David, heal me. And that was one of Christ's names, son of David. David loved God, and God loved David. And Moses was special. I think the top two spots go to Moses and David. But if I am wrong, it doesn't matter. We shouldn't worry about it. <laughs> and the 12 apostles shouldn't have worried about it either. You're not going to get top spots away from them. They're going to have it. Um, Mark 10, 41. Going on with the story. Mark 10, 41. And when the 10 heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. Others, the others say, hey, they want the right and left hand. We want it. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, lord it over them. You know, I'm high muckety in this district of the Roman Empire and, you know, whatever the deal was. And lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. In other words, we don't want an autocratic, abusive form of leadership. That's what Christ is saying. Christ does not want that. Uh, obviously, leadership requires making some decisions, and people are like, I don't like that decision. You, know, you can talk to us about it, but still, um, God wants a servant-type um, church. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, he shall be your servant. In other words, you want to be great, be the guy who does the most, who's there when they need it the most, who's encouraging the most people, who's serving the most people. That's the way to lead. That's really what Christ is saying. Um, well, verse 44. Whosoever you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. Verse 45 but to serve and to give his life a ransom for the world, or for many. And boy, is that true. Christ gave himself as a ransom for many. Now I'm going to come to the tip number four. <coughs> talk to pe people in person and not online. Or you could say, talk to people offline. Be face to face. Um, there are many problems with society. I was watching this 
this show, and they were talking about some of the problems of teenagers and young people and crime, and they were saying, and COVID only made it worse. We're having to wear a mask and be isolated. If you're in a real blue state for maybe two years, couldn't even use the playground outside, which is good for people's health, but crazy, overly autocratic leaders, especially in blue states, did it. As many of you well know, since we're in a blue state right now. But the point is, the skill of being face to face with people was lost, or at least it's not as good as it should be. People don't know how to negotiate with each other. Because if I don't get what I want, I get mad and I want to st hit somebody or, or scream at you or stab you or even worse. People haven't learned how to make friends and alliances face to face. And among younger generations, a lot of the social skills, not that we were that great when I was in high school, and I'll admit it, we weren't the best people, and so I, you know, all that stuff. And But I think because you didn't have all the online big tech stuff, all our relationship had to be pretty much face-to-face, -face, didn't they? You had to learn to get along, and they even say kids playing outside a lot, which we did when we were younger. You built certain human skills, especially boys dealing with each other, who's going to get picked first, who's going to, you know the kind of stuff that, that, that we do or used to do. A lot less of that's going on in our world today. People need friends that are face-to-face -face friends. They need to know how to deal with other people. And, and so if we can improve our skills, we can help people more if we're talking to them face-to-face, -face, in person, or at least on the phone. Because that's, and of course, if you want to put the television phone in there, you can do that too. we we'll see them, but um, it depends on the angle of the phone. Sometimes those, those telephones look weird. That's, uh, anyway, that's me just saying that. But, but human to human, face to face, person to person skills, really serve other people, help other people. And it's more than sending them 50 likes from people that they think they know but really don't know. Number five, the last one of those, is be a cheerleader. First Thessalonians 5.11, Paul says to encourage each other. That means you have to listen to each other with your heart so that you kind of understand them. Listen with your heart. See what they need. So if you find a person who's uh, maybe he's got an alcohol problem, drug problem, or she's got a deep marriage problem, and I, you know, all these problems that people have, and um, or a lack of confidence because life has kicked them in the shins. And even if it's their fault part of the time, it doesn't really matter. Life has kicked them in the shins too many times, and they're discouraged. You say, I'm going to pick that person and be a cheerleader for them. Um, and you're going to say things which amount to, you can do it. Just buckle down and I'll maybe give you some encouraging help and words. You can do it. Hang in there. Don't get discouraged. You can get this problem under control. You're the master of your own faith. I have faith in you. And you know, when somebody shows faith in you, I think it it actually makes a difference. You know, maybe your grandparents say, oh, we believe that you can do it. You can do it. And I wish I had this newspaper clipping. When I got commissioned, my grandmother and my mother were there, and it was in the newspaper, a big city. I was shocked because they clipped it out. But I, would, I mean, I know it's not a big deal because that's a long time ago, but it's nice to have them in your corner. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, and um, as I've said before, my grandparents were a big help. And I was listening to someone, it was on the radio, and, and they were talking about aborting the baby and this and that, because they had horrible parents, and they said, and we're going to be horrible parents. This child is better off dead. And I thought to myself, the child is better off alive, and maybe if the parents can't fulfill it. Maybe the grandparents, like in my case, can step in and make the difference. And my grandparents made a great difference in my life. My only point is, 
maybe you can be the grandparent that steps in and makes a difference, right? I mean, it's possible, right? You say it. You got to get kids that will, anyway, that will be willing to listen to you. But, but find somebody, maybe a grandchild or somebody, and you say, I'm, when and if I can, I'll be a cheerleader for them. Because it might make a difference. It might just make a difference. And now I want to give you the, maybe one of the greatest examples in the Bible. The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is one of the greatest examples of servant leadership. You realize that um, the two letters to the Corinthian church, there was a third one which didn't get preserved, but that church had a ton of problems. Paul served that church and did part-time work as a tent maker and maybe other things as well. So he would never have to ask the Corinthian church for anything. And he tells them, I served because I loved you. And being a prosperous uh, shipping city, I'm thinking this. He probably said to himself, they're going to say, oh, this smart Jewish guy is going to take advantage of us spiritually. So he said, well, if that's the case, I won't take any money from you. And he later when he said, I'm not even writing you this letter so you'll start to support my ministry. No, I'm serving you because I love you. I want you, not your money. I'm trying to give you an idea of how much Paul served the Corinthian church. So I want to just put that in context. Now I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians 11, 23. And just think about the service that Paul gave that church, the Corinthian church. But actually he served all the churches. And if someone were to say, who is the greatest apostle? I suppose a lot of people would say Peter or John. I would probably say it was Paul, but it doesn't matter. You know, Christ will make all those big decisions, and um, and Paul will definitely get a high position, whatever it is. Second Corinthians eleven twenty three. Now he's in comparison to critics. He's talking about inside the Corinthian church. Are they ministers of Christ? I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. Now, when he say deaths, often, you might think, well, that's just poetic. When they stoned him, um, and you can read about it in the book of Acts, they actually thought he was dead, the mob that stoned him. Who knows? Maybe he was dead. I'm not saying he was or wasn't. And then the you know, disciples came some hours later after the mob was gone. I guess whatever, they're going to pick up the pieces. He came back to life or came back to consciousness. He might have been dead or almost dead. And um, he says he fought beasts in Ephesus. They did have an arena in Ephesus. I think it was like 25,000 people. The one in Rome was maybe 55,000. But it was like half the size of the arena in Rome. And we know what they would do is they take... Three or four Christians give him one of those iron nets and a couple of spears and swords and let one or two cougars or lions or tigers loose and they bet to see who's going to win, who comes out alive. Maybe Based on that word, Paul might have thought he was facing his death. Obviously he won because he, he lived through it, but I'm saying he did face near death, if not actual death, many times. Verse 24. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one, because the Jews wouldn't want to break the law, so they give you 39. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. I can't imagine. Uh, let's say there's a, a big piece of wood from a ship that's you know, crashed on the rocks, and you climb on that big piece of wood, and you've got to sit in the ocean a night and a day before you rescued. Can you imagine how scary that would be? Can you imagine how scary that? Not only worried about sharks and other things, I just think, wow. And then you get back up, do some more ministry, and get on another ship and sail someplace else. You talk about courage and service. That is courage and service. Um, verse 26, in journeys often. In other words, he was on the road a lot. He could have said, we got this big church in Ephesus. I'll just stay here and be the bishop of Ephesus for the next 20 years, and they'll all pay me a nice salary, and I'll live a nice life. I mean, he could have said that. But after he got that Ephesus church going, I think it was a little over two years, he went on, traveled, you know, to create more uh, people, to convert more. 
um, <clears throat> journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, toil, and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fasting often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things what comes upon me daily. Now notice this, after all those perils, you know, in his travels a lot, then guess what his next big pressure and concern was? Besides these other things, what comes on me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who's made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation? Now, was all they'd write Paul or tell him about all the problems of all the churches, and and he was trying to you know send messages and send evangelists like Timothy and um, Titus and others and Apollos to try to put out fires in different churches. That's a lot of pressure. That was a big concern of Paul. And I want to close this sermon with a statement. I believe it to be true. Here's my closing statement. There is a law. There is a law in human behavior. The more you serve others, the better your life will be. In other words, giving is better than getting. I know that sounds contrary to logic, but Giving is better than getting. The more you serve others, the better your life will be. Um, the more you serve others, the better you'll feel. The more blessings will come to you. And they'll be automatic, like there's some law. I can't. Even, you'll get automatic blessings. Um, and if you look at the contrary of that, the more selfish you are, the more miserable you'll be. Let me say that again. The more selfish you are, the more miserable you'll be. You think, well, if I just save stuff and get it for myself and only care about me, won't that make me happier and richer? You would think that, wouldn't you? But I don't think it's true. And wealth does not bring happiness. You can look at a whole lot of stars and sports stars who made millions, but they're mad about... Even the famous Harry and Meghan got millions and they're still complaining. They're royalty. He's a prince. I guess she didn't get a title, or her kids don't get a title. She's mad about that. But I mean, anyway, they're about lucky, and they're complaining about stuff. Um, so the more you serve others, the better your lives will be. Serve, 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 and be blessed, blessed, blessed.